Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is from the incredible mind of our brother from another mother, Mr. Michael Lockhart. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled The Last Buffalo Hunt. Let's get straight into that. Carson Sheffield, the long rifle for the expedition, sighted down the barrel of his Sharps 50. As the best shooter among his peers, he had purchased a rifle and cartridges with the highest grain capacity and length. Old Charlie at the trading post had assured him, I has got some reach, some kick too, but it'll take down even the biggest bull if you load the cartridges right. And a good aim, of course. And old Charlie had been right and had done well in his trades with the hunting crew, led by Jim Pruitt over most of the past decade. The current hunt included a truncated crew and supplies. The count of freely roaming bison had been so reduced that making a livelihood from hunting the gargantuan bovines was coming to a close at the crescendo of slaughter. He had the sight picture. Even as he inhaled, he let out half a breath, all the while pressing the slack from the trigger. Crack! The rifle roared in his ear, damaged by years of following his profession, and so that it registered as a dull thump. There was a ragged line of answering rounds from his companions, followed by the sounds of swift and practice reloading. Carson no longer bothered to check on his targets until he had made his second shot, and he had learned that long ago, when the herds were thick in numbers and it took the individual members a moment to register that they were in danger and to determine from what direction. The herds were thin on the ground these days, and he had to get in as many shots as possible before they stampeded away from the horror of speed and lead. He dropped a cow on the far side of the group and reloaded his rifle. He saw mostly dust, no more clear targets. He wouldn't waste the ammunition that was expensive and time-consuming to create and maintain. He kept sighting, always hopeful, ever the marksman, when eventually, through the curtain of dust and bits of dry grass, he spied a massive form on the far side of the herd. It stood on a slight hummock of dirt, the only rise the eye could easily detect for miles. Well, there were plenty of them. The plains looked flat, but for those who had lived and worked on them for as long as he had, the slight rolls in the landscape were quite apparent. He watched the big bull for some time, and stood still and observed as the rest of the beasts scattered and fled from the death sticks. And then it turned its head towards him. When Carson wasn't sure whether the light played a trick or dust had coated the thick, woolly hide, but it appeared that the creature had a white or at least a very pale face and form, and he could see its eyes glaring across the distance. It was a long shot, but this was the largest bison he'd ever seen. He had to try to take down the monster. The hide would fetch double or more of the price than that of an average one would. He carefully hugged up to his stock and began to sight. Why, well, it was a long shot indeed, and with no target. The big fellow had somehow managed to disappear. Carson cursed a little as he lowered his barrel and climbed to his feet. Now the herd wouldn't get far, and there was work to do. Now that the first part was completed, he looked out and noted twelve carcasses. No, eleven. One was still struggling to regain its feet. Carson quickly aimed and fired to put the creature out of its misery. Herd was too thin to get more at one time. Jim Pro called out the obvious. Guess we'll have to make do and chase down the others later. But it won't get far. Mo, Jake, bring up the wagon. We'll get these fellas skinned and cut some tongues and hump steaks. Maybe we'll cook some innards tonight. He grinned. But he was always happy to gain profit. Bison was scarce these days and most hunters had shifted to other work. Yet he loved it and was happy to get in on the last days of the glory days. It would all soon be a thing of the past. Well, I hear government's gonna outlaw buffalo hunting. Big Al rumbled. Young Charlie said he's seen it in the paper from Dallas. They already closed out the Yellowstone up north. The engines are gone. Well, that was the whole point. Nothing for them to eat or wear or live in. No way for them to be what they were. Not many. The critters left, he said a little wistfully. 
took another bite of his steak to indicate that he played his role in a conversation that was now done. He often spoke for a little, early during any gathering, and then left the remainder of the intercourse for others to complete. Carl, the eldest of the group, a slender man weathered by the harsh sun and winds, nodded. He hacked a bit and spat before he took another drag of his fresh field quality. I recall Quanah Parker. Why, he's right over all the slaughter of the buffalo. Ugly some bitch. Took out of his pie. I reckon even uglier disposition. Pissed at the world. Still some big herds in those days. But the railroad hunts took care of that. Poor, benighted brutes were just trying to keep up with their old ways and trying to feed and clothe their young ones. If they hadn't been so heinous in their own acts, so ruthless. He paused, deep in memories of the days long past. Well, that bastard Sheridan was pretty ruthless to them. Guess I can't even get mad about it. Only fair, I suppose. Plenty of blame the way folks treat each other. He looked towards Carson, who, as usual, sat quietly, listening rather than speaking. I have to say, though, Carson, why I'd love to have had you at the battle, old Billy Dixon would have given you a run for your money. At the end, he shot that red devil right off his horse at almost a mile. Scared off the rest of the Braves and the old Quan himself. I reckon, when he finally heard about it. And he said it was luck. Only time there was no strong wind. Carl cackled a little, as he did each time he told the off-repeated tale of the second battle of adobe wolves, as though to punctuate his comment about the wind. The chili ghost howled through the little encampment and kicked up the small blaze of dried bison chips that served as fuel. The wind was nearly ever present on the plains. And Carson smiled. Funny, I don't like the killing, never did. Bad enough shooting animals, they're innocent, just resources we need. I certainly wouldn't want to shoot people, renegades or not, had enough of that during the war. And he stared into the fire for a moment before he continued. I don't like what follows. In war or hunting. Lots of hard, stinking, bloody-handed work. Skinning, butchering, staking, lifting, stacking and hauling. All in the weather and dust. I thought I was going to back that big old bull with a white head and shoulders today. Biggest I'd ever seen. Bold rascal. First time I ever really wanted a particular one this badly. He shook himself from the reverie into which his thoughts had carried him. I mean, we all pick out the best ones. The ones that look like they'll fetch a good price. The, the biggest. Well, this one was special, though. Almost too big to be real. In that pale face. And he trailed off back into deeper thoughts. And Carl shrugged. Probably best you didn't bag it, though. Engines always said that there was something special about the white buffalo. Of course, they thought everything was special. Bunch of dirt worshippers. And he trailed off and then stubbed out the remainder of his smoke. Everyone was tired, and it had been a long day, and they had had to work hard to obtain, then process the hides and leave them stretched. They'd taken a total of 27 of the big bovines, a pitiful haul measured against the bounty of hunts in the early years of the trade. And when Carl stood his bedroll and wrapped himself snugly against the cold, howling wind, he found that sleep was elusive. And he tossed and turned with troubled dreams that night, despite his fatigue. And sounds of the wind and the rumbling of millions of hooves that carried tons of muscle, bone and hide. The black horns that glinted in the sunlight. Or moonshine then haunted his dreams when he managed to doze. Images of the beasts plunging over cliffs, driven by nearly naked people who waved spears and axes and whooped and screamed to panic the herd. Blots of spattered gore steamed across the nightmare landscapes. He awakened suddenly climbed to his feet wearily and ambled out of the way from the fire to urinate and just enjoy the now gently moaning wind as it passed over the otherwise silent plains. And from a great distance, he heard yips and howls. Neither the party was near Palo Duro Canyon. Coyotes and other wildlife were abundant in that green and watered space on the otherwise dusty plains. And by tomorrow, if they maintain their course, there will be breaks in the surrounding landscape. Hills turn inside out as Jim liked to say. The land did not rise, but rather dropped in spaces. It gave the appearance of rises to the untutored eye, but it was mostly just land that had collapsed long ago to form fingers that led from the main canyon. 
A blast of wind hit him and almost caused him to fall backwards. He walked back towards his blankets even as another gust rose and nearly snuffed out the low-burning campfire. The rapidly moving air spoke of ice descending from the north and sounded haughtingly like that of a great bison bull. Well, it was getting on into autumn, and when winter arrived, it would be time to head back to the trading post over the frozen ground. Now, he had placed a few more chips and a small tumbleweed on a little blaze and pushed out the little rocky embankment around it, so that it could breathe without the flames blowing around too much. He noted that each of his companions twitched and moaned in his sleep, suffering from nightmares even as he had. He wrapped himself warmly and saw peaceful slumber, but a thunder of hoofs soon resounded in his dreams once more. This time, he ran ahead of the herd. The sharp tips of their black horns pricked and grazed his skin painfully, especially down his left arm, and drove him forward, hard, racing. He felt their hot, hideous breath that induced nausea and the rising gorge as the lead member snorted and chuffed. The dust choked him and obscured his vision. It was hard to breathe and his chest hurt badly. And then he was out over the edge of the cliff, falling alongside soon-to-be-dead creatures, and would himself first to strike the rocks at the bottom. Mo and Jake were usually the first to arise. They were younger than the other members of the team, and accustomed to working long hours, even in the off-seasons. Mo was the elder and had been old enough to work for his former master before the war. Jake had still been pretty young but assigned various chores, appropriate to his age and abilities. In the aftermath, as a freedman, they'd gone west to seek their fortunes and worked alongside men who fought on either side of the conflict and on neither. Many had only recently come to the Americas, others for various reasons had opted to remain aloof and take advantage of the increased trade opportunities. And despite all the misery of the reconstruction years in the eastern world, they found that the west each had to be his own man and make his own way. They'd earned the respect of their peers and learned that they were valued for their skills, especially in close company, when every man mattered. It made both men feel freer than any proclamation by politicians. Although they were both grown men, Mo tended to look after his younger brother, and Jake tended to follow his elder brother's lead. And after so many years together, they'd become a very effective team. They had the reputation of being the best meal team handlers on the South Plains, or so they and their friends had claimed. Hey Mo, I don't think we're going to get much of a haul this time. Might be time to look into another adventure. And like so many conversations among the group, this one was old and often repeated. It was only so much to discuss in a life confined to horsepower. And Mo shrugged. He rarely said much, but he always tried to answer when he knew that Jake was unsure of the future. Yeah, I reckon on this being our last hunt. You heard what Big Al said about the law changing. And he paused for a moment and considered how many changes there had been in just his lifetime. He and his little brother had seen so much since their early days with a huge family. And Jake failed to note his brother's inward-looking gaze. Well, laws or not, more money than usual or not, we'll have to figure out what to do next. I like your idea of getting a little ranch or farm. We know how to do that kind of work. We do just fine. Maybe settle outside of a good town and find us some wives. And he trailed off, now sunk in his dreams of a bright future. They were interrupted by the stirring of the rest of the men and it would be another day on the trail of the ever-dwindling herd. It was unlikely that the beasts had gone far. In fact, Mo registered a ripple of movement on the horizon that indicated large, shuffling creatures. <sighs> Gonna be another busy day, little brother. As the rest of the group stirred, it was Jake who first noted that Carl had not moved from within his bedroll. The thin man was too still, and the younger man knew what he would find, even as he removed the heavy hide that Carl had clutched in the coldest part of the night. The pale, drained features, now slack and unmoving, stared up into the morning sky. The eldest of the hunters were gone. There would be no work for a while, after all, other than digging a grave in a hard soil and searching out rocks to cover the burial place. I can't believe it, Jim spat in frustration. All the water's gone. Mo nodded. Yes, yeah, sir. Not a drop in the kegs. Just what each man had in his canteen. Carson, 
thumped one of the kegs and turned it over to observe it on all sides. No damage. Odd. Like the bongs were removed and they were emptied and then sealed once again. No sign of the dump water though. Have you noticed any other supplies missing or tampered with Mo? Moses shrugged. Well, nothing missing, but everything I've looked at this morning has been spoiled. Even the meat we took yesterday. The hides dried okay, but some of them looked like they were riding faster than they should. He shook his head. Well, it just ain't right. Never seen nothing like it. Hmm, me neither. Maybe we should inventory what we have and see what can be done. Not sure we could make it back without water and fresh food. Carson eyed Jim, who nodded. They soon discovered that all the food was spoiled in some way. The flour had weevils and mold. The bread was entirely green, despite the almost total lack of humidity. And the meat was rank and stinking. Their dried vegetables had turned and gone brown. And there would be no breakfast after the heartbreaking work of burying their friend and companion. Well, we need to get some fresh hides and get these others stretched again to dry some more. Maybe smoke them this evening. Jim announced once they completed their miserable review of their provender. Gonna be a hungry trek. He shivered. Cold too. You can feel the ice in the air. Ah, not a single kill today. Haven't even caught a clear sight of the herd. Jim groused about what was obvious to the rest. He felt it was part of his job to keep everyone on the same track. We chased the bastards for miles. He trailed off and looked around at his crew. So much for making some last kills to fill their bellies and to honor Carl. Maybe we should go on down into the canyon to camp. Should be water and some small game. Mo, you think you and Jake can wrangle the wagon down the trail once we're below the walls and lose the sunlight? Mo shrugged. Well, it depends on the trail. Well, if it's wide enough. Well, he shrugged again. Well, we got a good team and near full moon. Let's look for a way. And Jim nodded. Well, I'm sorry, Mo. I don't know why I bothered you with that question. It's been a bad day from early this morning. He looked at Carson and Big Al and raised a questioning eyebrow. I was a little slow to take up the actual question. He assumed it was about whether they agreed on seeking a trail before nightfall. Where well, the horses, they can handle any of the regular trails. And Jim decided to accept that Carson's faint smile as agreement on what he'd actually intended. And we had a rough day and lost a friend. So... I want to announce something before we get busy with the work ahead. Mo, Jake, the rest of us decided that when we break up the crew and go on our ways, we're not only giving you your cuts, but the mule team and wagon. And normally we'd sell them and divide out the proceeds, since we are paid to get them, or offer a good rate to any of our outfit who wanted to buy them from the other members. But you two have more than earned that bonus. It doesn't look like we'll make enough to pay like a normal haul, but nobody could have worked as hard as the two of you have Every season, we've been together. We're all proud to know you, and we'll all sign off on a recommendation letter for you. And Mo and Jake glanced at one another, and then stared at Jim for a moment. Boss, we were going to ask about buying the mules and rig with our shares from this hunt, and some of what we saved. He looked at Carson and Big Al. Uh, we've been happy working with you. We're looking at a little settlement down in Trinity County, built by free men and their families. Well, if any of y'all decide to go that direction... You're welcome to travel with us. Carson nodded. Well, I'll be heading back to Montgomery. Well, it takes the same trails most of the way. I'll be honored. Jim grinned. Good deal. I'll be with y'all ways. I'll branch off at Waco and head home to Lockhart. Al simply shrugged. Glad y'all like it. You sure done good work. I'm going up to Dodge after this. Maybe try my hand at cattle droving. The party members were in a better frame of mind as they followed the canyon rim and searched for a trail by which to descend to the green floor and the fresh water that awaited. And off to the east, Carson spied the last of the herd as they disappeared down into the earth, or so it appeared. Apparently, the bison had found the trail before the men had. A lone member of the herd stood at the rim while the rest followed the trail down into the canyon. And while it was impossible to tell with certainty, Carson was sure it was the big white bull, once more standing sentry, for the herd. And he was equally sure that it stared at him with menace. Ah, uh, do any of you see that? No one replied. He looked around to querulous features, then back to where the buffalo had roamed downwards. The horizon was now empty. However, 
It marked where the trail was. I have as the white boar. I saw the last of the herd descend down that way, he said to himself. Shortly, the party reached a point of descent. The trail was wide and welcoming. They rested their mounts for a moment and then began the journey downward, along the worn, out from it, on switchbacks, and Mo had been correct about the moonlight, as it was brighter than usual, as the orb appeared to hover just over the center of the opening in the earth, and was never obscured by the clouds that gathered around the edges of the silvery light. When they reached the floor suddenly, the ground simply leveled, and the strain of the descent ceased. The cannon was shallow at this point, but still rose a good 300 feet above them in the grey shadows cast by the moon. Fortunately, not only had the trail been wide, but the slope had been gentle due to some ancient crumbling on the walls in the area. Now it was clear where the buffalo had gone. They tended to leave easy spore to track. Well, let's go down the river, Jim suggested. We could all use some fresh water. Well, it's cold, but I'd like to splash around a little and wash off some of the stink from cleaning hides yesterday. Sand scrubbing just didn't do enough. Well, the rest agreed and they were soon encamped near the banks on a grassy spot that caused a bend in the little stream. This time, there was wood for the fire rather than bison chips and tumble weeds. And Carson was glad. And it was his turn to cook, and he wanted to serve meat that was smoked with clean mesquite rather than dried offal and thorns. Not that the chips stank too badly, he simply enjoyed the taste of wood smoke. And the smell from the tumbleweeds depended on their constituent parts. Now, all he needed was meat to smoke. However, try as they might, none of the men were able to spy any game, large or small. The floor of the canyon normally crawled with game after nightfall, yet nothing seemed to stir this season. Even the birds had gone still, and the coyotes refused to sing, despite the moonshine. And Carson noted that the orb had now shifted towards the northern wall. It would soon be out of sight, and there'd be a near darkness. The clouds overhead had thickened and blotted out the cold glittering stars, and they hinted at a possibility of rain and cold water pouring from the sky. He shook off a chill. Maybe even early snow, he mused. When the men were tired and hungry and stayed awake to talk, despite the fitful rest they'd gotten in the nightmare-ridden sleep of the previous night. And Jim started a conversation this time. Al was staring into the middle distance and clearly dreaming of buffalo hump steaks. So, what do y'all think? If we don't take any beasts tomorrow, I say we call off the hunt and head back to the trading post. We won't get much for these, but we may be the last hides anyone takes for years. And he glanced down at the ground and lowered his voice. Maybe forever. A glum, pensive nods greeted his pronouncement. Big Al awakened from his reverie, and wanting to get past his part in the conversation, added, well, I'd like to get that big white bull Carson keeps seeing. Oh, Carl was right. Angels look up to those. Talk about them like other folks talk about church. And Mo surprised the group by joining the campfire talk. Well, he was usually one of the listeners. Well, it depends on the tribe, but yeah, lots of them seem to think highly of the white buffalo. Seems to be a good omen, maybe. Some kind of protection spirit. And Carson nodded. I've heard things along that line. Too bad he didn't protect them from the likes of Grant and Sheridan. He stared into the fire and then let out a sigh. <sighs> From all the settlers that came this way, for that matter, been coming since the 1500s. Spanish, then other folks from all over. Nothing new, I guess. Folks have likely always wandered and shifted where they lived. Probably why they fight so much. But I guess when people live their lives in different ways or simply look different. Others won't like it and will take advantage. And he looked meaningfully at Mo and Jake. And Mo nodded. He knew Carson was a friend. He tried to talk politely around some touchy subjects. Well, it is what it is. Hurtful acts on all sides. Plenty to go around when people mix it up. Plenty of good too, though. Most folks are decent. Or well, try to be. Once the ruckus starts, well, it's hard to stop. And he returned, the meaningful looks at her cousin understood which sides. He'd meant and that they were now on the same side. And the men shed a smile and a nod. 
When a wind picked up as the hunter spoke on old tales and legends of the South Plains and several about Old Kong. Eventually, fat drops of moisture began to spit on the men. And before they could get everything under cover, a torrential downpour had snuffed out their fire and would have spoiled their supper, if they had any. Thunder, lightning, and wind combined to make the evening truly miserable. They spent the night mostly awake, tending to their mounts of draft animals and trying to contain their camp items within the confines of their little territory. The wind howled and the rain followed by large pellets of hail lashed at them as they huddled in a group beside the wagon. They soon lost interest in checking on the animals and simply huddled miserably beneath their limited shelter. And the storm raged until just before sunrise. And when they at last called out from their emergency refuge, the first realization to dawn on them with the rising sun was that they now inhabited a small island of muddy sand and with water flowing rapidly to either side. The second was that the horses and mules were missing. Well, where could they have gone? Jim asked for the fourth and fifth time. At least his volume had finally descended to a level that made the rhetorical question less obnoxious. The stream around their tiny island had slowed and lowered as flooding waters tended to do in an acrid climate. Yet, they were surrounded by a mudflat on one side and flowing water on the other. Even had the mules remained, they would not be able to move the wagon for another two days or so. Well, there were no tracks. The rain and the hail had erased all trace of the beasts of burden. They unloaded their gear from the pack animals and of course the saddles and bags from the riding beasts. Everything they had was now stored under the wagon that reeked of wet, rotten buffalo hides. Carson looked at Mo. You think it would, uh, it would do any good to wash and stake out these hides, or are they too far gone? His friend shrugged. Well, it's worth a try. We can get them away from our sleeping spot. Maybe the rest of us should do that while you go out and scare up some game. I volunteered Jake to cook. He grinned at his younger brother, who eventually smiled back at him, each man doing his part to shake off the feelings of dread that had encroached on the hunting party. I had had bad experiences over the years, but the past couple of days had been horrendous. Yeah, go ahead, if you can get across that muck. I ain't too deep on the inner side. Still cloudy though, look out for another rain. Jim was getting better at stating the obvious. He'd always had a talent for it. Maybe the mules and horses will come back. The old cigar moldy, but they don't know that. Carson cased his buffalo rifle and brought out his smaller model that he used for game. He checked to ensure that the cartridges were dry and ready. I hope I can get something soon. He called to his compatriots once he slipped and stumped through the clicking mud. He travelled up the canyon towards the last direction the herd had gone. He thought that perhaps other animals would have come out to investigate their large neighbours who had fled to safety the previous evening. Yet no living thing appeared. He barely caught the flit of birds and insects that were normally so abundant on the canyon floor. Well, there were tracks beyond what the hail had left. And then he saw them, standing in the middle distance, and grazing on the grass and licking at the last of the moisture it contained. He concealed himself behind a mesquite tree and switched out his rifles. He kept the rounds dry and checked the one he now carefully loaded. None of the big creatures seemed to note his presence at all, though he saw several that were clearly on sentry duty. He selected, loaded around and prepared to take down fresh meat. He didn't bother to load for secondary targets. What the expedition members needed was food, not hides. He took careful aim and gazed down the barrel at a nice fat cow, and as he reduced the slack in his trigger, a white shadow occluded his view momentarily. He blinked and raised his head slightly, knowing what had passed between him and his intended target. There he is, Carson thought triumphantly. Oh, I'm gonna blast you, booger. He was assured of a hit. The distance was middling for most hunters and short for him. He felt that if he could only take out this monster, and the ill fortunes that had played his party would fade. Everything would go back to normal. He sighted once more, the heart of the beast clearly in his sight picture. 
the old fellow even posed for him, positioned his leg to open up a chest on neck shot. The wind was favourable this week, and he reduced the slack in the trigger, and eventually the hammer fell. The round flashed and fizzed and smoked, but no projectile fled the barrel, only noise and stink and light. He looked in disgust as the herd fled, clumps of mud and grass flying in their wake. The white bull held out until the others had gone. He cast a baleful glance over his shoulder and trotted in the wake of the others. His hooves flicking up chunks of mud were his contemptuous gait. The Carson scrambled to load a second round, but as fast as he was, the herd was faster and found places and wished to disappear. He cursed for a while, and then switched out his rifles and set out once again to find something edible and easy to kill. And he determined to stay in range of the herd, though, just in case he got another chance at that white sum bitch. Jake had determined to find other sustenance. After they staked out their pitiful hall of hides, he struck out in search of edible vegetation. There might still be a dried berry or two clinging to the various briars. Maybe some tubers or greens, some cattails, even some cacti. Well, he had less luck than he had thought he should along the stream, and so set out for a patch of vegetation near the base of the canyon wall. It was opposite the one that descended. The upward slope looked gentle enough on the lower part, and he got steep near the top. Just enough to make climbing dangerous. He shrugged. I ain't gonna climb it, no ways. He glanced quickly over his shoulder. He didn't want to catch grief from his older sibling about using poor quality English. And Mo regularly reminded him that they would have it hard enough without sounding ignorant. And Jake laughed at himself. He deliberately used the silly words. Sometimes it was good to cause folks to underestimate oneself. It was simply his habit to avoid annoying his sibling for whom he had the greatest respect. His thoughts wandered far afield, but he managed to stay on course and mind his feet, until he heard the scratching, fast-paced rattle, the distinctive warning from a western diamondback that he'd tread on its territory. But he froze in his tracks and rolled his eyes to either side. His heart thudded in his ears and pounded in his chest. He was deathly afraid of snakes, he eventually spied the source of the noise, a particularly large representative of the already large species. It was near some brush and stared in his direction, head raised and cocked to strike, should the need or mere inclination take the creature. And Jake took stock internally. Well, I'm a good ten or twelve feet from it, and I'm wearing boots. I'll try to back off slowly, and if it moves, I'll hightail it back down towards the creek. The serpent struck out and moved towards him, which determined his reaction. Jake turned to run. He didn't see the second or third strike that perched on nearby rocks above the tops of his boots. He felt the stings and the instant sting and burning sensations from their strikes, and the pain and shock caused him to stumble. His right hand slid into an opening under one of the rocks and he felt at least two more strikes. He rolled away to one side and more of the venomous reptiles treated him as a threat to their nest. His last thoughts were that he should have stayed in camp rather than go out in what heat there was this day. Still pretty cold for them. Guess I stepped into their home, and now I just want mine. Mama, save me. Moses. As the daylight waned and the shadows lengthened with early twilight in the canyon, Mo began to worry about his younger brother and to search the horizon for signs for him. There were clumps of trees along the little river that would conceal a human, but there was plenty of open space as well. He was first to see Carson as he returned from his unsuccessful hunt. The man looked positively dejected. His head hung low. He all but dragged the rifles he loved so well. What happened, Carson? You look like you lost your best dog. And Carson shrugged. I found the herd and that white devil. Did everything I knew how but nothing worked. First time, the round failed. Second time, a gust of wind threw off a long shot. And third time, you won't believe this. And he paused and Mo nodded encouragement to his friend. And third time, a tumbleweed blocked the shot at the last second. Like it just appeared from nowhere. I ain't never seen one travel faster than a bullet. And he shook his head. 
kept changing rifles and looking for smaller game too. This place is usually flush with all kinds of animals. Barely even saw any birds. None of a size for Eden. He looks at Mo in the eye. We may have to cut our losses and leave the wagon and hides. Maybe come back for them later. This hunt, ah, it's not right. The white buffalo is haunting it, uh, us. Mo nodded. Jake went off to look for plants to eat. He's been gone for too long. Not like him. Why don't you get some water and some rest? I'll go out and look for him. He should answer when I call. Please let Jim and Big Al know what I'm doing. Carson nodded and the two men went their separate ways. Soon, the remainder of the party gathered around a small fire for warmth, bellies empty and spirits low. I heard Mo in the distance as he called out his loud baritone in hopes of bringing his brother back to camp. When his night drew quickly near, he returned to the camp and addressed the others. I can't get him to answer. This is not like him. I know we have only a few minutes of light, but will y'all help me look for him? The others quickly acquiesced and literally rose to the occasion. They understood that this situation, silence from Jake, oh, was a bad sign. Maybe we should go in pairs with all that's happened, Carson suggested. The other men agreed, and he and Mo set off in Jake's last known trail, and Jim and Big Al followed the stream as it rushed, still swollen, down the canyon. And Carson, eyes ever sharp, was first to spy the dark, limp form. Mo, I think that's him by those rocks, at the base of the wall. Mo felt his heart pound and then plummet as he registered that form was indeed his brother, and that the utter stillness indicated his worst fears. He lurched forward, intent to rescue in the young man as he had so many times in a lifetime of travels and travails. Yet, he felt the iron grip on his upper arm as Carson seized him. Wait! The man hissed. There's something else over there. And Mo pulled towards the crumpled form and stomped in his efforts to escape and run forward. The stomp awakened more than one of the Serpent Horde's members, and the night came alive with rattles, hisses, and scrapes of rough scales against rougher surfaces. Mo froze in horror at what he now understood must have happened to the little boy he remembered, now the young man of whom he was so proud. His gorge rose, and even as he realized his own danger, he heaved and emptied the little bit of yellow acid-laced bile that was all the contents that remained in his stomach. And Carson took his arm and shoulder and gently but forcefully moved him back from the area. Come on, partner. We have to let them settle. Well, I can't really see whether they are near him or not. Well, it's cold and getting colder. They go underground soon. We can ease up and get him when they do. Well, he saw that Mo was in no condition to undertake such a hazardous task. He held the man across the shoulder. Well, there was no other comfort that he could offer. No solace for the profound grief that his friend had yet to truly fill through the shock. After the temperature dropped rapidly as it was to do in this environment, and the snakes settled, Carson walked up slowly to Jake's body and took a hold of the shoulders of his jacket. He performed an experimental tug, all the while prepared to flee for his life. He heard a few scraping sounds from under the rocks, but saw no movement. He tugged the corpse a little further, it was heavier than he had expected. Jake was a big kid, but he believed himself to be quite strong. I guess a fellow gets weak from not eating for a few days. He excused himself. He managed to slowly get his burden shifted to a safe range, and Mo fell to his knees and sobbed and wailed piteously. Carson stepped around him and interposed himself between the nest and his two companions. Some time later, they carried the body back into camp, and Jim and Big Al had not yet returned. I hate to see him looking like that. A purple and swollen and scared look on his face. Mo stared in turns at the fire and at his brother's dead features. I just can't believe it. This is just not happening. I just saw him. He was the only one of us not to beat down from hunger. Such a good boy. Trying to look out for all of us. He shook his head and repeated similar sentiments every several minutes. And Carson, who'd lost his share of close friends and family, to include an older brother in the Indian Wars, understood the shock and that it would wear off eventually. 
where do you suppose Jim and Big Al got to? They must have followed that stream a long way. Maybe they got into something. He looked up at the sky and noted the clouds once more threatened, and he heard a low roll of thunder in the distance. It's like the herd went back up to the rim and started running back and forth with one of the old-time large herds, buffalo ghosts. He mused. Couldn't be the herd we're following. They aren't big enough to make that much noise. But at last thought, was bitter. Oh, he was hungry, near exhaustion, distraught with grief for his fallen comrades, and concerned for his friend's distress. Added to all of that, he now had two more friends who were missing and likely in danger. He picked up his buffalo rifle and stood. Mo, why don't you stay here with Jake? I'm going out to check on Jim and Owl. At that point, the cold flat drops of rain began, quickly followed by a deluge that included pellets of snow and ice. The ground soon turned to treacherous frozen slush, and the streams began once more to rise. Shortly, the men found themselves huddled under the limited shelter of the wagon, and with frozen mud penetrating the clothing under their backsides, and the most abject feelings of misery that either man had ever felt. Alexander, Big Al, Boschnevsky stomped along beside his boss as the light rapidly faded. He had no idea why they would go looking around in the dark. He liked Jake and cared about his safety, but it seemed senseless to him to put the entire group at risk for one man. Or if he was hurt, or even dead, there wasn't much that they could do. Nothing, really. Or if he was okay but lost, then he had the good sense to stop and try and find shelter. He may have even found food. He considered, hopefully. He passed the point of anger at the lack of sustenance, and he was now in practical survival mode. He knew that he would soon weaken, and he decided to hasten the search process in the only way he knew. He cupped his hands around his mouth and bellowed. Hey, Jake, where are you at? Jim Pruitt startled at the sudden thunderous noise at his shoulder, and he recovered quickly and decided that Jake did not answer, or there was no way that he could make more noise than Big Al and so he simply kept a sharp eye out in the gloom. He could still make out shapes as the sandy stone reflected what light there was. The shadows lengthened as they drew further from the camp. He glanced up and saw the gathering clouds. They would likely get another gully washer tonight, he speculated. Just what we need, he grasped internally. I sure hate for our last hunter, gone so badly. Wanted to finish on a high note. A last fond memory of all the money we made, all the kills. Was that movement up ahead? His thoughts were shifted by the reality that impinged on them. Shades played upon the shadows as massive figures shoveled in the murkiness of the eerie night. He glanced nervously at Big Al. Hey Al, you see that out there? The movement? Al strained to see. I can maybe see something. Hey Jake, that you? Jim once again jumped at the sudden shout. He hadn't realized how highly strung his nerves had become. The shadows froze. There was a dim ripple of movement, black on slate gray, and then eyes. Pairs of gleaming, red-rimmed eyes that pierced the Erebusian curtain and bored into his soul. His nerves inflamed towards fear and then rapidly onwards into panic. How? It's the herd! Run! He made good on his directive. It was no more than a physical eruption from the final snap of his taut nerves. He turned and fled into the night and left his large companion, who stood staring blankly at the eyes in the dark, as he attempted to understand the threat that had so inflamed his friend's senses. Bigal glanced back towards Jim as the man's lean form quickly faded into the darkness, and then he turned back to watch the weird eyes. And they had moved much closer. And he now registered the thunder of hooves that huddled tons and tons of flesh and hides and hooves and horns towards him. Eyes blazed from within the humped silhouettes that would soon engulf and overrun him. And at the front, a figure emerged clearly. It loomed larger than the others and was visible because of the near glow of white hide. And far too late, Big Al decided to flee. And for his size, he was a fast runner yet his pursuers had the advantage of twice as many legs per creature to propel themselves forward a 
at incredible speed. Along with some malevolent power that drove them towards the callous hunter. His efforts were forlorn and doomed before they'd begun. He felt first the hot breath on his neck, and then the hot ache of a horn as it pierced the flesh on top of his shoulder. The agonizing sensation of being lifted slightly on one side, and then the flesh that held up his weight parted and fresh misery engulfed his senses. He inevitably lost his footing when his feet once more impacted the ground. His final pains involved hard, surprisingly sharp hooves pounding him into so much ground meat and mill. Jim ran at top speed. He had to determine whether he could stay ahead of the storm of beats behind him, or risk turning aside in hopes of losing them. He determined on the latter course and fled to one side, the one closest. The canyon wall ahead rose in stygy and gloom, where he slowed somewhat in fear of tripping and injuring himself in an ever-increasing darkness. He reached the little river and plunged heedlessly into it, and he was surprised to find himself in chest-deep waters. He must have found one of the deepest portions of the stream. Just my luck, he said, obviously and fruitlessly. The current was strong in the swollen waters, and he soon found that he was unable to find purchase with his feet, and so gave up and began the flail with his arms in an attempt to paddle across the depths. But the water was deathly cold, and he felt numbness creep into his extremities. He found that he was not making progress. He was already short of breath from his desperate sprint. He grew tired and decided to rest for a moment, and he again could not find his footing. He searched desperately to find the bank ahead, and panic once more swamped his perceptions when he realized that he could not see the far side. He looked around desperately and eventually realized that he had gotten turned around, and the current had pushed him into a bend in which a deep pool had formed. He thrashed around and tried to float among the swells, but he could no longer find the bottom much less purchase on the rocky bed. He calmed himself and floated, paddling strongly to keep his head above the water as the swells kept circling him and tugged at his body. As he relaxed, he noted the noise of the stream as the waters rolled against the hard earth. He heard distant thunder, and instead of once again setting him into panic, he found the sound soothing. And before long, large drops of heavy, frozen flakes began to patter all around him and he lost all hope of finding the bank or even a shallow spot on which to rest. By the time he slipped beneath the surface, the rain had become a torrent, yet he was at peace. The last sounds he detected were of distant, muted thunder, or perhaps it was the thunder of enormous hooves. The next morning, the bedraggled pair of intrepid hunters crawled from beneath their mud-soaked shelter. The wagon had sunk on into the earth several inches. Had the rain continued, the heavy wagon would have trapped the men underneath and drowned them in frozen muck. Sky looks like blood, Mo observed. Indeed, the morning sky, visible above the rim of the canyon, had begun with the crimson streaks of fading clouds. And Carson nodded grimly. Well, that's a sure sign of death and doom. We have to get out of here, Mo. I say we bury Jake and start climbing. Al and Jim will have to make their own way, provided they are even alive. Well, something must have happened to them. Maybe we could search on our way to locating a decent trail. And Mo shrugged. I got a better idea. We're both weak from hunger and strain. We put Jake in the wagon, uh, our wagon, then cover him with the best of the heights. Well, that guy says still more weather. Later today or tonight. The ground is hard with ice, but the wagon will bury itself and Jake with it, most likely. No other way to get ourselves out of here alive. But we could always come back later and make sure. And Carson nodded and assisted his friend with preparations. And when the last hide was in place, he took out a length of rope from the storage box. Let's tie this to a wheel and use it to hold us up while we cross the stream. Are hey, you a good swimmer? And Mo shook his head. No, but I make do. Ah, it's not deep. Gonna be cold, though. He shivered in anticipation. And Carson shook his head in turn. I grew up around creeks and rivers. Doesn't have to be deep to sweep a man off his feet and down away. If we go at the same time, we can brace each other, and we have the rope. 
As he had spoken, he tied one end of the length to one of the wheels of the axle. We'll wrap it around us and then feed the slack from the far end as we go. It's not that deep, nor that wide. And so we'll be across in short order. And the current was indeed strong, and it took longer to get over the stream than either man had imagined. The strength of nature, embodied in the flowing stream, impressed Mo. He understood, in the end, that the rope and his partner were all that saved them from being swept down the torrent. On the other side, they stomped themselves as dry as they could. The air had already begun to get frigid, and now dressed in sopping wet gear, they realised just how cold a human body could get when it had no options for warmth or shelter and no others of its species to provide succour. Both men shivered and shuddered and felt the abject misery of their existences. Cold, starving, wet, exhausted by their struggles, and with two dead comrades and two more missing, and no doubt in peril. Carson insisted that they retrieve dry socks from their makeshift bindles. It was a misery to sit and work the boots from their feet and expose their bare flesh to the elements, but it beat getting frostbite, or blisters. Each man took a moment to ensure that his weapons were loaded with dry cartridges. Carson had brought his heavy buffalo killer, and Moe had traded out his older hunting rifle for Carson's more modern version. Cartridges dry and feet damp, they set off on the trail of their friends and to reconnoitre an escape route for as many of the party as still alive. And they came upon the ruin of Big Owl's body even as they halted at the base of a trail, a nice, broad trail that wound its way to the top of the canyon wall on the north side. The marks of many hooves covered the ground and the trail. There wasn't much left of the man. The remains looked more like a smear, with some shattered bones covered with a reddish-brown stains that was once a vibrant and strong human. The skull was shattered, but the face remained intact, hideously distorted, but clearly the colleague. The empty eye stared up at the two men as both a warning and a dare to continue onwards. And Carson shuddered. Oh, I'm not taking any dares. Now march to bury and we need to climb. Maybe some rocks piled over the remains? Mo nodded. They went silently to work, covering the mess before them with rocks and gravel from the floor of the gaping gash in the world that was the canyon. The weather remained cold during their efforts, but the air was dry despite the clouds that hurtled by above them. Or well, it was nothing to eat. But before they began their climb, they would need to slake their thirst and fill their canteens for the march ahead. The nearest access took them back towards their old camp and wagon, a nerve-wracking proposition, but necessary for their survival. The men squatted at a wide, slow-flowing pool that swirled on the surface, and Moe finished drinking and refilling his canteen first, and stood. He looked around nervously, expecting at any moment to be faced with a wave of snarling, multi-ton hides and flesh and sharp hooves and horns. He gazed at the busy surface of the water to calm himself. The deep pool was an odd feature in the small river course. He noted an object that bobbed near the far shore, just under some brush that overhung the pool, and it was held fast by the scum of ice that had formed over the near still waters at the edge of the pool. Well, we just found Jim. He announced, even as Carson stood and followed his stare to the object that Bob had only a small portion showing at the water line. Well, we can risk crossing. We have a trail. Jim would understand. He'd tell us to go, to save ourselves. Mo remained silent and made no gestures. He simply turned and started walking towards the climbing trail. Carson quickly followed and the two men were soon trudging their way back up to the flat plains above. When they reached the rim, they paused to catch their breath. Hunger and privation had taken a great toll, and each regarded the other, and though they did not say a word, their thoughts synchronized exactly. You sure look thin and hollowed out around the eyes, my friend. Once they had their bearings, they determined to make for Addo Wells. It was the nearest outpost, and they could get food, shelter, and warmth. Upon the flat plains, the wind soon beat at them, drying the moisture from their bodies and sweeping it up, into the menacing clouds. And there was a splinter on the canyon ahead, a landmark familiar to both men. They would have to go around the end, but initial dip and crack in the surface of the cap rock, literally pointing them in the right direction. A gaping arrow delved into the earth to send unwelcome visitors elsewhere. 
and they were a few landmarks ahead, but they slogged onwards. Eventually, Carson's sharp eyes noted a dark line ahead on the far horizon. A haze of dust rolled through the air above the line, and as they drew nearer, the line became lumpy and individual figures emerged into sight. The herd! Without a word, the men came to a halt and stared at the beasts that had evolved from pitiful remnants of prey into a stalking menace. One figure towered above the others, larger than ever. The huge, white hump rose above the others as a mountain might tower over foothills. And Mo finally broke their stunned silence. We're not moving, but they are getting closer. Fast. The two men desperately ran back towards the point that branched from the main canyon in hopes that the herd would not follow them over the edge. And at first, they seemed to fall on hope that they would even reach the split before their bulky pursuers, much less have time to clamber down to safety, or they would have to slide down near the tip of the opening. It dropped off precipitously within a dozen feet of the opening. By the time the crack was in sight, and they each believed they could maintain their pace until they reached it, the thunder behind them rose to a crescendo. The cold of the wind was forgotten with exertion, and the heat of massive bodies, the pumped hot mammalian blood, and snotted hot, fetid air onto their backs. There was no time to look, only to leap out into empty space. And Carson checked his momentum at the last moment, and turned back to grasp at the walls as they formed the point at the shallow end of the crevice. Mo chose to pour on steam and leapt forward, limbs flailing in search of purchase. He felt his heart leap into his throat in a moment of weightlessness, the way a buzzard might feel when it glided effortlessly on an updraft. He thought absurdly. Although it was a long drop, the ground rushed up to meet him sooner than he had anticipated. He had transformed from the likeliness of a soaring carrion bird to food for the actual avians. Carson clung to the wall and stared over his shoulder at his friend, his last companion and business associate, plunging to the rocks so many feet below. The only sound was a thudding crunch combined with a splash of blood and fluids. Mo uttered no sounds, no protest at his cruel fate. He simply died much as ancient bison that had been driven over the cliffs by primitive hunters once had. Carson choked back his gorge at the thought, and then he realised that he should check on the activities of the herd. They had not come hurtling over the edge to crush him into the steep defile where Moses had perished. He looked up and over the rim and rose only enough to get his eyes above the dirt and frozen grass. The weighty beasts stood around either side of the wedged opening and panted and steamed. Their eyes focused on him, red-rimmed and angry faces, filled with too much understanding. And when he turned his eyes forward once more, he found himself looking into the face of the gargantuan white bull. Its eyes were red-rimmed as well, but in the middle they appeared as twin pools of Tartarus that reflected an endless well of utter lightlessness. Steam spewed forth into Carson's face as the creature exhaled in hatred. The stench of death and decay was on his breath and overwhelmed the man's senses. He felt his grip weaken and his body slide towards the abrupt edge and the fatal fall that awaited. The group of men gathered on the verges of the trading post at Adobe Wells and gawked at the figure in the frozen grass before them. Can't believe he made it this far, only to die on the edge of the settlement, young Charlie said to his companions. Right here inside of anyone who cared to glance at him. He lay down and died. Looks terrified. Got to wonder what the rest of the party has got to. This was the last group still out on the plains. But John Hardy, who discovered the ice rim corpse, shook his head. No point. The buffalo were gone, and Yah will be shutting down your mercantile shortly. Time to move on to other endeavors. Buffalo hunting is a thing of the past. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What an absolutely awesome, mysterious, and sort of paranormal story there. 
from the incredible mind of our good brother from another mother, Mr. Michael Lockhart. Absolutely awesome and refreshing story there, Michael. Could definitely feel those men's plight at the ever deteriorating situation. Of course, I really hope you enjoyed my rendition. And thank you ever so much for all your support and kind input on this channel. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, if you're an aspiring writer or would just like to have a crack at things like myself, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. Well, if you guys enjoyed that one as much as I, there's lots more on the way from all of your favorite authors of the channel and also some brand new authors in the mix, which I'll get to as soon as possible. As ever, guys, I hope you're all happy and well and taking a fight back to life. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.